the side of the picture the most obvious. Yes. We're not going to get into that. Uh, <laughs> no, so I, I you know, um, we spoke and I, I, and I, and I went to actually, I went to his website, Wikipedia, just to look this up to make sure that I, and I'm going to read it off the phone because I didn't want to miss anything. But he has been a physicist, biochemist, collage artist, photographer, film analyst, author, academic, and figure style guitarist. Um, I'm going to just quickly talk about the last for a split second. Um, Arthur played South by Southwest less than five years ago. Um, so he's still very active and obviously very interested in many different things. So please welcome Arthur Tuffley. First, it's, it's a pleasure being here. I would like to thank David, of course, and the Society. And in the back, I'd like to thank Michael and Catherine, who are responsible for this wonderful presentation of this tarot deck. So thank you. So, Sarah, went all through that stuff, and here I am. 
Here you are. What time? What time period was this? Um, sixties. Yeah, sixties. So, I mean, it's interesting also that you were studying photography before it sort of crossed over into being accepted as fine art. Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that that was that was a problem. That was a problem. Yeah, but um, the people I stood with, Robert Heineken, typically was an artist who used the photograph technique. Uh, he would slap a piece of photographic film to a TV set. And he has a whole series of newscasters that are slightly blurry because it took half a second or a second to expose the, the sheet he would then print it. And of course, it was a comment on the news of the day, far beyond our comments today on news. You know, so he, he was rather brilliant in that, in that aspect. So, yeah. Also compressing time. Um, one thing about Arthur as well is that um, since we, we met a few months ago, every once in a while my email will ding and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get a few photographs from him. And each one is a gem. Um, and, but it tells me a couple things. One is that you're, you're, you're walking around looking at things in a different and I can tell you, when I did my residency here, I was here on and off for about two years. And then I was cur curator here, and I was here for an extra. I've been here a while. And you got a photo of the staircase there that I never would have seen. So, um, kudos. Well, um, thank you. But also, just, you know, I, I like the fact that it's a continuing practice, and you're not precious about it. You're just doing it. Um, it's, it's great. So, when did you start to move from photography or can you tell us actually a little bit about what kind of things you were photographing at that time? And oh dear, at that time? Um, I, well, another experience I had was studying with Minor White, and John Upton said, well, there's this workshop up in Oregon, you should take it. I said, mm, okay. Uh, so took a workshop with Minor White, and for some reason Minor liked my work and invited me back to be his assistant the next year. Why, I still don't know. So basically I was photographing in the Andrew Adams and Michael White tradition. <coughs> On my website there's, I recently put up the Book of Stones, which is sort of of that era. And I was living in Venice, up there, when it was cheap and disreputable. <laughs> uh, now it's expensive and disreputable, yes. but be that as it may. Um, and my, there, my house would be broken into fairly regularly, <laughs> six to nine months. And of course, I'd steal the cameras because that's all I owned that was of value. So when I didn't have the cameras for a month before the insurance, you know, wrote the check, I would do collage, magazine collage. I would, you know, go to the local equivalent in those days, the recycling center, you know, grab a stack of magazines and do collage. So that got me interested in taking existing images and reworking them and perhaps reviewing something that wasn't originally intended in them by combining things. So I've been interested in collage from then, so whoever stole my cameras, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did me a great favor. Well, that's actually what, what I was interested in learning was, was how, you, how you transitioned into collage um, from, from straight photography, for lack of a better term. Um, and also, I guess, the, the, the mentioning Minor White begs the question, was the fact that he was proficient in a couple of different mediums something that you thought about at all? I only knew him as in his photography. Okay. Yeah. Because he painted as well. Yes. That, that um, I, but you didn't do not know at the time. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so. Because another thing about Arthur's work that I was really struck by when we were going through, you know, his portfolio is there's a real range to it. Um, there's images of flower arrangements that are pretty straight photography, although beautifully exposed. And then there's text pieces, and then there's work that's more like the tarot deck that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, let's talk about, actually, I, I wrote some other stuff down. I'm, I'm building to this, but I just want to get a little more background for everybody. Um, you also have worked Alice in Wonderland, Dr. Hilly, Hamlet. Well, I, I like illuminating books because whenever I go to the Getty, it's my first stop. You know, it's those incredible illuminated books. And I, my favorite.
fantasies that are done by these monks that sit around and just do nothing. And I love being in my little cave at home. You know, I don't wear the brown suit, but, you know. <laughs> you drink a lot of beer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I just love being there working, you know, and details and little things like that. So I've always loved limited books. And uh, a friend of mine once said, well, James Joyce said, Ulysses, yada, 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 yada. And I said, well, I've never read it. And the comment was, well, no one has. <laughs> uh, so I said, well, the only way I'm going to read it is to actually illuminate it. So I read it word by word, the whole thing. And of course, did my illuminations, the borders, the illustrations, and, and things like that. So I actually, that's my way of getting to read some. I don't read well. I mean, I have all sorts of mental problems. That usually clears out the first row. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, dyslexia, uh, scotopic insufficiency, etc. So reading is very, very difficult. So actually getting to read a book is, is a major thing for me. And I figure the only way I'm going to do it is to read it word by word and digest it and then translate it visually. And like with Ulysses, I tried to do with the images what he did with the words, which is puns and alliteration and all those rhetorical tricks that he used. And I would discover them, which is really nice. And same with Hamlet and um, I keep saying Forbidden Planet, but it's uh, The Tempest. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> association. Uh, again, Hamlet is wonderful reading it word by word to really see what Shakespeare did. And same with Don Quixote. And I recently did the trial because uh, Shirley and I were in Prague for how many weeks? Were there? Four weeks, something like that. And we never got to the Kafka Museum. So I figured, okay. I have to make up for that, so I read the trial, again, word by word, illuminating and illustrating it. And uh, for Adam and Joachim, my grandkids there, I did Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, which I hope they enjoy. If not now, later. <laughs> so, uh, so that's it. I, I, I illuminate books because I can't read. There you go. <laughs> well, there's a lot, there's a little bit to unpack there, actually. No, I, I mean, because part of the reason that, that um, books were eliminated was in a pre literate society. Mm -hmm. That's how you're communicating ideas. Mm -hmm. and they were a very fast you know, way of carrying ideas around. Um, but also, I mean, it's interesting that you, to hear that you're a little dyslexic because um, I, I read a little bit of Oliver Sacks. You know, it's interesting how more and more people are realizing that dyslexia is less about. Um, a deficiency or something, it's more of a different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And it, you have you actually have access to different ways of processing information that are, you know, much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I can say that, people. Um, Definitely not. No, but I but it, I, I believe that actually. And I, it's remarkable how many musicians are dyslexic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, just present company included, come to think of it. So so there you go. Um, but also, I think there's also, there's a, I, I recently um, was at Crotona Institute up in Ojai, and someone was talking about how to read a, a, a sacred text or a philosophical text. And her, her advice was, read very little and then stop reading for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Which I've started to do now, and it's actually improved my attention and my appreciation much more. But it also sounds like what you're doing through your oh, process. Yeah, well, I mean, Ulysses, you can't read very much. Well, right. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I mean, sometimes just 10, 15 <laughs> words, is, you can go, okay, that's it. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, it's about the only book that I've read where I wanted a seatbelt. <laughs> 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 so did Sylvia Beach before it was over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell, tell, tell us a little bit about, so you, you worked with collage and when, when your cameras were stolen and you were able to, to find this new way of expressing things and that led to elimination. Can you tell us a little bit, I, I really enjoyed when we, when we were speaking before about you, you telling how you um, actually 
work in the digital age putting this stuff together? Oh, well, yeah. Well, rather than magazine collages, <clears throat> with the uh, computers now, we have access to infinite number of images. And um, I very much like, as you've seen from the tarot cards, I very much like the 19th century engravings and uh, some 20th century. And I have, uh, turns out, a lot of 19th century engravings have been reproduced uh, typically by Dover. You know, they have a lot of Gustave Doré's yeah. things, which, which I love. Yeah. And the nice thing now is I hate being the book ghoul that is cutting books up. Magazines I don't mind, but I don't like cutting up books. I call those people book ghouls. Um, but now we have scanners. So basically I've scanned probably 15,000 images into the computer. And I, I work with those, which is really nice. And with the digital, of course, you can flip them, turn them upside down, rotate them, size them. In some cases, distort them however you want, which is really very freeing as opposed to cutting out little pieces of magazine. And my problem is, not having a lot of hand-eye coordination. I need a pair of scissors with a control Z on it. <laughs> you know, undo. <laughs> yep. And the same thing when I try and draw something, I need a pencil with a control Z on it. <laughs> so. Right. Well, no, I mean, I think it's an interesting way of working because um, it sounds to me, and you can tell me, but the, the, the impression I got was that you're, what you're doing is you're, you're creating a library of images that speak to you and then sort of open that up and using it for whatever project. You're not necessarily collecting images for a specific purpose. No, 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 no. You're just no, finding things that you just can resonate with you. I, I find an image and I say, oh, okay. Yeah. You're in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just intuitive. Right. Right. You know. No, and I think I think that's that's a really, you know, a great way to work. I mean, you know, back in the day, you had a box and you put a lot of different clippings in it, and you go ferret it through and find something like that. Yeah, basically, that's it. But yeah, yeah, that's just it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. What is it about 19th century imagery that, that resonates with you? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I think it's the cleanliness and the idea of the nostalgia in a way. Um, and since we're looking back a hundred or so years. I think that it's like an extension even further back. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, I mean, the, um, in, in the caves discovered under Rome, where they had the grotesque, the, mm -hmm. the word grotesque comes from grotto. And, and the Roman grottos were paintings on the walls. And so when the Germans discovered these, they called them grotesque. And that's where our word grotesque comes from. It doesn't mean, you know. <laughs> so what they did and what the illuminators did in, in, in the pre-Renaissance time is they basically went back to the designs from the Romans, from these, from the grotesque. And of course, the Romans took their designs from the Greeks. So they've been sampling that's what we call it today. You know, they've been sampling for centuries. Yeah. And I, I find those 19th century uh, engravings, while I'm sampling them, to me they have echoes that go further back because I think they were sampling also. Right. So it's no, like there's some culture baked in too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not only 19th century. I use medical illustrations and some contemporary, more contemporary stuff. I mean, what comes in the mail, you know, what I call snail spam. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, often it's pictures, and I say, oh, okay, I can use that. So they come from everywhere. Right. They come from everywhere. Right. But I think in, in the cards, I think most obvious are the 19th century illustrations. Spoken like it's a magician. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that I, I was thinking about as you were speaking too is that these techniques are, you know, you can consider them contemporary because they're digital. But you know, as David Hockney pointed out, people were using, 
you know, a, a beach from one scene and, and transposing a different image on top of it. Absolutely. And, you know, if they had Photoshop, they would have been able to save themselves a lot of time, you know. But there's all these perspective tricks and, and things that, you know, were already being done. Sure. Copying and pasting in this instance. Oh, yeah. Um, a little different than sampling, but similar. Um, I really love the complexity of your work and the, the way that um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot, formally there's a lot going on, and then there's this wonderful overlay of color that's really, really striking, um, particularly in, in the Prince and Gallery. It, it, it really snaps. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I mean, it has a beautiful quality as a printed piece, too. Um, one of the things, getting back to the intricacy, you said something really interesting about um, Mozart and folk music. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could share that with the group. Well, uh, to me, Mozart has the knack of writing a line where you know how it's going to end, and he never does it. What he does is perfectly logical and fitting, but not what we expect, which to me is really amazing. I mean, it's not like he goes wrong. Well, actually, he did. If you've ever listened to the musicologist Spass, uh, the musical joke, where he is sort of punning on his contemporaries that weren't very good, like like he at the end he he keeps trying to resolve and can't. And can't and can't and can't, you know, where I, I like the idea of a flow that makes an unexpected corner and yet it's the right corner. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I, the, the, what I'm referring to is that, um, you know, Arthur plays uh, folk guitar and one of the things that you mentioned about Mozart as well was that folk music was just as sophisticated. Like, mm -hmm. You know, and at the time in the '60s, people were like, "Oh, this is hillbilly music, or you know, it's a tradition. It's not, you know, it's not conservatory based." Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, if you really listen to a bluegrass record, it's twice, it's you know, ten times more sophisticated than what a lot of avant-garde compositions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, one of the, one of the things I do, if I have a guitar, I could demonstrate this for you, is that. Um, if you look at the Great Requiem Mass, the Dies Irae, which he starts with, it's basically a bass that goes boom, boom, boom. And if you listen to any great of the folk musicians, Reverend Gary Davis, Elizabeth Cotton, they're using their thumb to go boom, 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 boom. It's identical. Yeah. So the same ideas are not folk, not classical, but musical ideas. That, that's what I found fascinating about that. Yeah, and responding, yeah, exactly. And finding that purity in it, but also responding to the, um, the intricacy of it. So what I'd love to do is actually, um, I just want to wave a couple cards around and talk about the source stuff. Okay. Um, if you can use. Um, and again, if you haven't already, definitely uh, go to the gallery and see the, see the prints that Arthur made. Um, and, and, and avail yourself of this as well. It's beautifully produced, and there's a great book. Um, but so, in this one, for instance, you've got this guy, and you've got this bird. Mm -hmm. where, where did that come from? Well, let me describe how I produced the birds. <clears throat> um, that story. Uh, I was visiting a, a psychiatrist friend, socially, <laughs> And I noticed a basket next to the chair with probably two dozen decks of tarot cards in it. And while chatting, I sort of picked one up and opened it up. Now, we can't say this in public, so this is not to be, this is off the record. I was terrified by these cards because they were puppy dogs and kitty cats and unicorns and angels, little fluffy angels. And my previous knowledge of tarot cards is they're very powerful, magical objects. And it, it's, it's like putting ham in a bagel. You're bound to get struck by lightning. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, someone, someone somewhere on the other side is not going to like it. 
And that's the way I felt about these cards. I, I was actually frightened by them. And I mentioned this to my friend. She said, well, go do a set of tarot cards. It's right. So it took me about five years, but I did them. So I undertook this. And what I did is read, researched, looked at the history. And uh, there's the, the Rider Waite deck from about the turn of the century, which is pretty much the, the standard serious deck these days. And there's the Marseille deck, which goes back, I think, to about the 17th or 16th century. And I got one each of those, and I studied each card very carefully, and basically took a card and sort of lived with it for a couple days. It would be in my pocket. I put it on the nightstand when I slept. It would be with me 24 hours a day, except in the showers because they weren't, you know, laminated in those days. And uh, it's a family show. Yeah. And so I'd sort of try to figure out what was inside the card, as if it weren't on a thin piece of paper, but there was depth to it, and what was there, what was around the corner. And what I'd do is, on one screen on my computer, set up a, a blank page and start going through the library, and every once in a while, one of the images would say, me, and I'd sort of drag it over here and do that. And probably 10 or 15 hours later, uh, there would be a whole bunch of stuff here. And it would start organizing itself to make some sort of sense. And that's basically the, the way the cards are, are produced, or were produced. And it took me a couple years to, to, to do this. But basically, I feel less like an artist and more like a midwife. You know, like I was sort of the funnel through which the stuff moved. You know, so. Yeah, well, I mean, and actually something that's very interesting that about what Arthur just said that, that has always appealed to me is that if you talk to um, a, a good writer or a great songwriter or a great mathematician, they'll often say that the the work was already there, I just had to tap into it. Mm. Uh, which it sound, sounded very much... You know, and personally, between me and you, I find these cards frightening. Because of the process that brought them out, uh, I don't find them pleasant. I find them very disturbing. And I'm really pretty scared of them. And to me, that's good because that means they're powerful. And that was my goal, is to return some of the power that I felt should be in the tarot. Right. Well, I mean, and, and, and um, that's a really good point, because when you, when I first started dipping my toe into this kind of stuff, like most people these days, I went to Amazon and, you know, searched tarot. And it was astonishing, the stuff that came up. And I, I don't know if I was as offended as you were, but... <laughs> there were a lot of unicorns and puppy dogs. It was sort of like, really? Um, one of the things that I, I, I really like about, um, about these that I want to talk about is um, the way you establish a break symmetry. Mm -hmm. I really, you know, and I'm going I'm to just keep passing these around so people can, can see. Um, oh, yeah, are they not traveling all the way around? I'll send the next, I'll send the next one to you. Um, sorry, I'm being a bad news. Um, but anyway, I really, I, I, I really um, like that, and I, I was actually standing outside um, watching the slide projection go, and there is a core element of symmetry in pretty much every one, mm -hmm. but I was really struck by how you play off of it in a, in a really um, unique way to each image or, 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 or card, I should say. Well, the asymmetry to me gives energy. Yeah. I mean, if you have something so symmetric, it just sits there. Right. So the symmetry, to me, nails it down. But the asymmetry gives it energy. And as you know from a couple of photos I've sent you, the tondos, the circular photos, that's mm -hmm. where I'm heading. Right. It's where there is no symmetry, there is no gravity, there is no nothing. Right. You know, so. Right. Yeah. I'm going to pass this this way because I was asking. Here, take a 
couple actually. Uh, you can send them. You can send them down. Um, well, there's seventy of them. Yeah, there's. <laughs> there are many. Um, how did you choose? Was there? Did this come early on in the process, or towards the end? Did this back. image? Yeah. <laughs> Catherine called me up and said, we need a back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I think I made like five or six different backs. Something like that. And, and again, it was just, that one spoke to me. And that was it. Well, well, work on demand. Yeah, work on demand, exactly. <laughs> so this was towards the end of the process? Yeah, that was after everything. Okay. In front of the cards. And I sort of try to get the feel of what's on the other side of the card and sort of get the, well, just the feel of it. Yeah, so of course. The, the back sort of reflects. So if you see the back of the card, you're not shocked completely when you turn it over. Right. But I love the way, I love the way it feels like a, a heraldic symbol. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the use of the owls is really smart. Um, yeah. But the reason I asked is actually just Kind of for myself too, because I, I do feel at the end of a project, as, as you're putting it together, suddenly you start to see it clearly, yeah. in some ways for the first time. Well, some of the symbolism I use, I must admit, is pretty upfront, like the owl's symbol of wisdom. And uh, also, the other thing I try to do with, with the deck is to get rid of some of the racism and sexism that I found in the older decks. I want to make a deck for the 21st century. So, in one of the cards you have a, a woman that's a blacksmith, rather than a man as a blacksmith. Uh, there's an American Indian as one of the, one of the squires or one of the knights. Uh, so I, I try to make it racially broader than any of the previous decks and also more gender balanced. So that was one of my goals in that. But again, Owl is wisdom. I think this is, for today, I think that's a pretty obvious thing to do. So. But why not? Absolutely. I mean, it's beautiful. It totally works. Um, I did, as, as you were talking about uh, showing a woman as a blacksmith and stuff like this, I came across this image of, of justice as a warrior, mm -hmm. which I'm loving, um, particularly right now. Um, well, justice, I recall, has scales. Yes. And swords. Right. Right. Um, and the swords are red hot. <laughs> <laughs> they are. And again, when you see them in the gallery, they, 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 they really pop. Um, <clears throat> so, I can also see, obviously, a, a strong alchemical feel to these. Do you want to talk about that at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good call. <laughs> So, how's that on? I have studied Jungian psychology for many years, and one of, the, one of my great surprises about Jung was that he could go out in the world and find things, systems, and relate them to the collective unconscious. And I guess my greatest shock was that he found this in alchemy that he saw it as a metaphor that uh, the Philosopher's Stone is basically individuation or, or total self-fulfillment or, I don't know, totality. confidence, yeah. confidence in I am who I am, you know, as, as my therapist would put it. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of alchemical ideas in here of, of the albedo, the rubido, you know, the steps on the way to the Philosopher's Stone. And, yeah, that's enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, an interesting side note about alchemy, one thing is that the, the entire collection of the Getty um, came from this library, actually. Uh, it was bought from this, this library in the 90s. And so when they showed that work, most of it, all the Robert Flood books, that kind of stuff, it came from here. But it's also fascinating because um, it's interesting to see where it popped up as people's um, almost like a coda to their mm -hmm. thought process. Like when Newton finished Principia and basically established 
um, you know, physics, he ends up spending the rest of his time as an alchemist. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, Jung was very interested in it. And oh, it just yeah. keeps coming up as something that, you know, once they did the work they were known for, people ended up sort of migrating towards that. And I guess that's why I was curious about this. Um, it seems like something that most people cross at a certain point. Well, it, it's sort of like if, if you take science and you, and you run it backwards, you know, that's where you want to go. And that does not mean, as most as many people have said, that, that it's valueless. It's more like a foundation on which everything else was built. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, well, Arthur, thank you so much for, for taking some time with us. Thanks. And thank you guys for coming.